Welcome again to Automated Success Show uh, followers and uh, fans. I have another great podcast uh, to share with you guys today, or guest, I should say. His name is Mark DeSantis, and Mark is the current CEO of Bloomfield Robotics and many, many other uh, companies uh, that he's been tied to, but I'm going to let Mark, uh, who will probably introduce himself a lot better than I will, uh, go ahead and, and tell you guys who he is and and what his passions are and what he's all about. So, Mark, okay. take Thanks, Joe. Um, appreciate the honor to be here uh, and uh, the interest in the company. As you said, I'm CEO of Bluefield Robotics, two-year-old company spun out of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I am an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon. I have been almost two decades teaching entrepreneurship. And myself, I have been an entrepreneur now for about 17 years. This would be my third AI startup, fourth startup, uh, fifth startup overall, uh, all in some obviously tech related field. I like to go uh, particularly where friend calls them big and boring industries, where they have big, big industries that have quote unquote boring problems and bringing uh, really cool technology to solve that boring problem. The most interesting thing about ag is that it's the largest industry in the world. <laughs> and it, we solve these problems. We don't solve them, people don't eat. Um, and that's been true of some of my other past businesses as well. These are problems that if they're not solved, fundamental problems happen in society. And I think people think of tech, they often think of the fancy social media and all kinds of cool technology that uh, does a lot of interesting things. But there's also that technology can do some perhaps less interesting things that are more important than the interesting things. <laughs> and that's where I try to focus my energies. Yeah, that's, that's actually very well put. And, uh, you know, I, I love that you say that because, you know, sometimes there are some people that are actually, you know, scared of technology and they, they think it's, uh, they think it's bad for our future. But like, the you know, whole point of the show and the whole point of having people like you on is to kind of bring those things up and explain that, uh, you know, technology is good for all of our future. We just, people have to be open and willing to learn about it and realize that the only reason someone thinks it up is because they're trying to solve a problem. And if there right. wasn't a problem to solve, no one would even engineer the, the system. Right. That's, that's exactly right. I, you know, a lot of uh, ours came out of the university, Carnegie Mellon University Robotics Institute. And, and uh, I think if universities are guilty of anything, sometimes is they create hammers looking for nails, which isn't a bad way to start a company. You know, I created this fancy technology. I'm not sure how it could be used. Let me go try it out on these problems. But I think the most lasting, most durable solutions uh, where tech, advanced technology has been applied is where the people, and I can give credit to my co-founders for this, is where the people who are developing the technology are imaginatively thinking about a specific problem that they think they can solve and are spending probably more mental energy trying to understand that problem than they are necessarily developing a solution. Uh, when I teach my class, I always say, at the end of the class, I say, you should walk out of here with a PhD in the problem, not the solution. <laughs> if you understand the problem, you know, great quote by uh, Einstein, or let's use Lincoln as a similar quote. He said, if you give me an hour to cut down a tree, uh, I'll spend 50 minutes sharpening the ax. And, and that's, that's really what it is. I, you, Einstein, give me an hour to solve a problem. And I'll, I'll spend 50 minutes understanding the problem and 10 minutes on the solution. And that's a lot of entrepreneurs get caught up in the, Joe, I'm sure you've talked to some of, you know, they get caught up in the technique, the technology, and um, regrettably lose sight of the problem. That's, what's, that's the premise for all this. You know, Mark, if you didn't say it, I wouldn't have hit on it, but... Uh... You know, I'm, I'm actually thinking about making a commercial right now for our company. And it kind of like is to prove out like while others are trying to rework the current solution, we're going to just 
take care of the problem with the current solution that we have in hand. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, it's like like in our industry, and and then I'll let you speak of the ag industry because obviously you have something that's helping ag, and I want to learn about that. But it's like I'm also in a boring industry, right? When you think about it, we in the landscape industry, we cut grass. Okay, it gets very little attention. Uh, but it is a massive bit, bit, uh, industry. It's ninety billion dollar industry, right? Um, but the, the the situation that no one wants to talk about here are consumers, and this is I'm sure you're going to relate this to the ag uh, scenario and what you guys are trying to accomplish. But there's the ceiling that got set. You know, a consumer says, "I'll spend forty bucks an acre to cut grass." I'm not going to spend any more than that because they see it as an unskilled like task. Well, with cost of living increases and counselors and kids going to universities, nobody's telling kids get good grades. I say this on many of my shows. You probably heard it if you listen to the show. Get good grades to go cut grass. And that's not taking anything away from the from the people that still work for me to cut grass. The reality is they all want to get out of that position. That's this that's what robotic mowing solves. So what does to, to go build off of that, you know what problem is you know your system that got sure. engineered so yeah so if you go back uh really since uh crops were people debate this but the agriculture started about 10,000 years ago some people claim it was in china some people claim it was in mesopotamia but effectively about 10,000 years ago is when people started uh planting seeds and harvesting those seeds some kind of organized way and from that moment forward um they there's an essential activity that even people who have a tomato patch in their backyard perform which is they inspect their plants i mean name a gardener who isn't periodically going among their their plants and looking for things like disease or is there was water stress or maybe i could put a little more fertilizer here well that process of inspection is done on a on a massive scale when it comes to specialty crops now i'm going to differentiate here um we are not in the world of wheat rice and corn we are in the world of tomatoes peppers peaches uh pears ornamental flowers and all that those are very high value crops anywhere from four or five thousand dollars an acre to cannabis is in the millions per acre those crops require a particular kind of intensive and frequent inspection. And that is done for the most part by humans. Now, drones have been around for 10 years. My first $7,000 I made in my first startup, and when they sold the company, I made a total of $7,000, um, was putting spectral imaging cameras on the belly of Cessnas and they would fly over fields of corn. Uh, so the idea of using aerial observation has been around for a while and it works great, but for specialty crops, they have canopies and for cherries and blueberries and grapes, you can't really see the fruit from the air. You got to get right there, boots on the ground, looking straight at it. And that's what we do. So we take that uh, expertise that exists in a botanist or viticulturalist in a vineyard or a horticulturalist, and we put that in AI. So we put that, we embed that expertise in the AI, and then we combine that with cameras. Uh, cameras, not unlike the one that's just over my shelf, uh, over my shoulder, an older version, skeleton of one. We put those cameras on really anything that moves. We've used ATVs, tractors, I could go on. I have a running list of pictures of all the different vehicles we've used in the 15 vineyards. We're in three countries. You wouldn't believe some of the vehicles that are in vineyards in France, by the way. <laughs> Um, you attach that camera to a vehicle, you just drive up and down the rows and it snaps away and it images every plant <clears throat> because it's inspecting a plant repeatedly. It geolocates that plant. So it knows that, Hey, that's vine six row seven. And then that image becomes the foundation for the AI doing its thing. If I'm a viticulturalist, I may be a foot away from that plant. And as I'm at, looking at that plant, I'm taste of grapes, I'm looking at the size of the grape, uh, the, perhaps counting the grapes, the color, the shape of the cluster, the leaf density, on and on. All those things I'm observing and making notes. 
That's what we do, except we do it with cameras and artificial intelligence. <clears throat> Some differences. So how are we different than a human doing it? Well, first of all, a human inspector can probably do, in the case of grapes, and this is true of every crop, about a tenth of an acre a day. And that's a, that's a busy day, 150 vines. Our camera going at eight to 10 miles an hour on a vehicle, two cameras actually point in two directions, can do somewhere around 35,000 vines in a day, just going eight, 10 miles an hour. Spent, and the cost of that is the gasoline of uh, spent driving an ATV around for six hours, seven hours. So it's the scale, that's one. So you can inspect every vine, not a, not a half a percent of your grow, but literally every vine in your 300, 400, 500 acre or larger vineyard. That's one thing. Second thing is, and this is a more subtle thing. So if I give uh, the same x-ray to five radiologists, uh, all due respect to your radiologists who may be listening, apologies, <laughs> but you will get four or five opinions and they are highly motivated and highly trained. They just look at things differently. We are human. So if I ask people to inspect something, no matter how highly trained, how highly motivated, I'm going to get different opinions. And those opinions are different enough to make any one opinion somewhat suspect. Because we're using one brain, that's the AI that sits in the cloud, it's analyzing it, it's consistent, it's data-driven. On top of that, already by our estimate, like I said, we're in 15 vineyards in three countries, we've digitalized, what I mean by that inspected, turned into digital form, um, probably around 700,000 vines and probably around 700 million grapes. Um, there's no human on earth. There's no, there's no 20 bitter cultures in the world that have seen uh, that many vines, that many grapes. So we're seeing them in a quantity and in detail um, that is not observable by humans. So I would just make the case that any inspection regime, by the way, will fall to the god of, of, uh, of AI deep learning. So that's what we do. And then what does that mean? Well, it's the same thing for the human inspector. That viticulturalist is looking at that plant. It could be ornamental flower. It could be a vine. It could be any organic matter. They're looking at it. They're looking as a coach and a doctor. As a doctor, they're determining, hey, is there water stress? Is there infestation? Is there disease? So they're determining whether or not that plant needs a remedy or in some cases removed if it's... Uh, uh, an infestation. Um, they're also looking as a coach because they're doing those inspections repeatedly through the year. Hey, this plant needs more water or something about this. Maybe this, we need to do some de-leafing here. Certain times of the year, it has to perform at a certain level and that inspection is doing both of those. So we do that as well. So what it means is higher yields because we're inspecting everything frequently as often really as the grower wants it's flat fee we just charge a flat fee um as many plants as they want and over the course of doing that they are then able to monitor their crops uh, with a level of detail and level of precision and objectivity they've never had the result is higher yields um overall higher quality yields and what i call crop protection because they're seeing these problems very early on. And then lastly, and I'll just finish on this thought, if you think about it, right, if I can monitor my, my plants and geolocate them, particularly for perennials, plants that live beyond a year, multiple years, I can track the life of that plant. And I can track its performance the way I would a professional athlete. Its productivity, its performance. And then I can make adjustments to individual plants through the life of that plant. Now I manage not to the acre, I actually manage to the tree, to the bush, or to the plant, which is the ultimate ambition of every precision agriculture out there. Sorry about that long answer, Joe. That's just my, so, I get caught so, up in what I do, so, so forgive so me. So listen, Mark, first of all, you blew my mind. I, I mean, seriously, you, you were talking to me. I, I, 
literally was thinking I, I could let this guy just talk for the hour and a half and I should probably shut my mouth. <laughs> oh, don't do that. And, and, You'll regret and, that. <laughs> and, 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 my mouth, I'm probably diluting the, uh, the amount of, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't know, just great content that you're going to spew out, out in this hour. But, uh, you know, as you said, what you were saying, there's a few things that I just could not help but to be on my side of the line is, uh, you know, first of all, I think it's great how you mentioned you can monitor the life cycle of the plant. You can actually, because you can probably start to eventually one day predict uh, in a year where you get X amount of rain or X amount, whatever temperature type of yield. So you can start to let the grower predict a year. Um, That's right. Taking, you know, proactive instead of reactive, you know. Right. Um, then I think about, you know, I think about with what we're doing with robotic mowing right now, you know, so like right now I have 300, over 300 machines personally that are out of people's yards all day. And as you're talking about, I'm thinking, why do you not have camera systems like this on those robots that would identify an Austrian pine with the Plodia right when it starts and then report back or identify, um, a, uh, uh, you know, any type of fungus or any type of problems or bug infestation, you know, most people don't realize most, most bug infestations are on the bottom side of leaves um, because that's where they hang out to get shaded by the sun. I mean, there's so many things that a system like this could do. You, you have described where I believe this is going right there, which is, so what I described is what I call active collection. So the grower is saying, hey, Bill, put, uh, ask Susan to go out in the ATV and, and scan these four plots. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is I'm gonna take the harvester out and do my thing, and I'm just gonna kit out sensors, and I'm gonna passively collect data as an incidental outcome of me doing another task. So then it becomes costless. I'll give you an example. I didn't share this. My previous company is a company called Robotics. It's very similar to this one. It uses AI spun out of Carnegie Mellon, and it uses cell phones to collect the data. We use cameras we've made. That company used cell phones. It would put it in the windshield of a car, and then they would drive around a city, and they'd collect video data, and then the AI would assess the road surface for about three or four dozen features unique to asphalt and concrete. We use cars, so people would have to put a cell phone in the windshield, drive around. And somebody said, you know, why even bother with that? Street sweepers are in every city. They're constantly on the road. Why can't you just put them in the, in the windshield of a street sweeper? So I went to the largest, one of the largest street sweeper manufacturers in the world. And I said, this sounds crazy, but I'm going to give you a line of business. What we're going to do is... Um, we will split the revenue. You will go to all the people to whom you sold street sweepers and say, um, we're going to give you, we're going to give you data to help improve the quality of your streets. And it's not going to cost you a dime. And we're going to do it as you use the street sweepers. As the car sweeps the streets, the street, it sweeps the streets. As yeah. the thing does its thing, it's collecting data passively. And it's doing a second task. So what you described is exactly where I see all of the things that move, including your business, all the way up to a John Deere, to, you know, harvester. Everything that is moving in the real world: lawnmowers, tractors, combines, street sweepers, you name it, is going to be a passive collection platform. And that is going to be a stream of revenue for you, for your business, in addition to the, uh, in fact, the company that I, I can't name, but the big street sweeper company, I, they said, you know, Mark, I can envision a data a day when we give away our street sweepers to get the data that we then sell and make more money on that than we do selling street sweepers. So, 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 you know, Mark, I just got done developing an app with my daughter that for our robotic business that 
you know, helps people not only measure their yards, but I, I'm going to release it for free. It's funny you say this. I'm, I, it's going to be a free app to consumers so they don't over mow their yard with the robot. Because what, what happens is, you know, we, we've got to get out of the way of thinking with automation of bigger is better, you know. So uh, Americans are really bad at more horsepower, oh, oh you know, but, but with robotics, if you do a lot with very little energy, so people buy a bigger robot than they need, and right? That's not the grass because it's always moving around, right? So, so we're doing this app. But I'm explaining this to my daughter, who's 21, is telling her that you know, the amount of data we'll collect with that free app will pay for the app more so, app. and and then some. Yeah, you know, and I going back to even what you're doing, you know, I have been kind, of, and I'm telling you this. Some people listen to my podcast tell me they report back and think it's like an episode of Shark Tank because we, you know, guys like you and I are like talking about this kind of stuff and it's kind of cool. So I'm telling some of the manufacturers I work with right now, I don't see any reason why we can't be dealing with weeds with the current robots we have. And and my idea to that has been if you could somehow recognize would you have the system. You can, do you can do like, that. There. There's a, a, a there's a lion. Yep. There's a company you, called you Mineral. Just... There's a company called Mineral uh, created by Google. And it is a machine that crawls over fields and looks for weeds and zaps them with lasers. Oh my gosh. I need to talk to them. I mean, seriously. Like, so the guys... AI, AI, Joe, AI, my first AI company was for the US military 15 years ago. It's It would use... Um, machine learning early versions sort of work, not really kind of. Now the technology works and it works to a level and to a degree that is astonishing. So your idea of looking for weeds and recognizing weeds is not science. That is science fact. Well, that's um, so, and I keep telling people, you know, you see all this stuff about all these chemicals and people getting cancer and we're killing all the bees and we're doing all this stuff. Well, and I keep telling people, Robotics and AI, it's the answer. Because, it is. You know, the way we do it right now, it's just a broad brush. Just spread everything, and we don't have to figure out what's there, and it'll all die. We, we can do better. We can we can identify it, take care of it, we're done. That's why I say, uh, you know, I say, say to growers, uh, right now we manage to the acre. And you're right, we pour that acre, we, we uh, drench that acre in fertilizer and water. And the problem is, is, Inside of that acre, there are different plants are growing at different rates that require different levels of fertilizer and water. The same is true in a in a yard where just drenching the yard when probably a surgical strike would get the job done. Borrow from the U.S. military. What has smart what has smart sensors done for the U.S. military? We don't bomb the way we did in World War II. We don't have to. They build enough sensing capability so that it's very limited in the volume. So they target and they literally can target. AI is now cap capable of doing that. And I say this, you know, without tongue in cheek, to target weeds one at a time in a yard quickly and ne necessitate no use of, you know, drenching their yard and pesticides or lots of water or what are any other things you might do that AI can discern that weed from that grass from a different kind of weed. It works that well. Cause when we look at a picture, Joe, when we're to be clear to the audience here, when, when we image uh, a vine and our AI begins looking at that vine, it's not looking at a single image of that same vine. It's looking at multiple images of the same vine and then combining those images to create a 3D rendering of the image from a camera. And then it's looking at the pixel level at the image, at a level that even if you were a human observer a foot away, there's things you couldn't perceive. So with that level of precision and detail, it's not a stretch to, for the current version of AI to work. It's not a, it's not a, you're not talking about some super fancy version of AI. We're talking about run-of-the-mill, um, well-known, well-understood AI when you can get that quality of an image 
And there's nothing standing in the way of mounting a simple camera on a lawnmower, it's just side mount. And as it's doing its thing, cutting the grass, either in front of the mower or beside it or what have you, maybe it's multiple sensors, collecting all that data and telling the grower about things about their yard they probably ne would, could never know, if, even if they hired a dozen inspectors. This is not the future, this is now. Yeah, well, we need to try to figure out how to make that now for me because I've got a lot of little data collectors around. And, uh, you know, the, the, the hardest thing for us uh, in our industry, I'll just put it straight out there, is, you know, I already said there's like a seal thing, right? Well, yep. people want to spend for a year to cut grass. And but, I cut but grass they'll, every but day. You but know. there's a ceiling. It's sort of like uh, if I, I'm, I'm an old enough to remember pre Starbucks. And I remember my grandmother using a, 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 you know, she made coffee in this percolator, which no one in, that's listening has probably ever seen. I, or I know the percolator. I do. Okay. It's not the sign we're talking about. The younger <laughs> right, people. Right. This, I know yeah. what it is. Yeah. Right. And if somebody would have told my grandmother, hey, grandma, one day, people will spend more for a cup of coffee than it costs that percolator for one cup. She just said that, you know, well, I know what she would have said. And yeah. it's because they, Starbucks provides a value that that, that, that that percolator could never provide. I guarantee you, Joe, I guarantee you, people will spend more than they're spending now to have their grass cut if, you expand the value proposition to them just using the simple, what I would call the, you know, quote marks here, the simple tools that are now readily available with technology. You're, you're actually, you're solving the hard part of the tech problem that any company like mine has, which is moving the camera around. That's actually the most expensive, hardest part of the problem. The AI, not a problem. The ability to move data, get it into the cloud, do the magic, show the grower what they need, not a problem. Moving the camera, moving the sensor around cheaply and efficiently, that's actually the most expensive part of the problem. And you're solving it already. Not unlike the street sweeper company. I mean, we're, we, we work with tractor companies right now. And we're, they're just saying, hey, please put, please put one of these on my tractor. I want to see how it works. And it works fine. Yeah, well, and, and what's crazy is uh, we, so there's two things that, you know, that to say and bring up as we're talking about this now is, you know, we're doing big corporate campuses, you know, 20, 30 acre campuses, right? 20 units in a campus and it's seeing all sorts of stuff, you know? And, and then when I look at, like, uh, so like my brother and I own a nursery and we were actually just talking about the fact of how much time we spend like cultivating and doing all the stuff and rook, rook pruning. So you're going to kind of like this, but my brother and I have pigs and stuff now to do this stuff because they do all that stuff anyways and it's for free and they eat the stuff for one day. But I keep telling my brother, we should just plant grass, put robotic lawnmowers, it'll just kind of cut because in a nursery, you don't want anything to grow up because it right. shades the bottom of the plant. So I'm like, we could just have little rings and mow. Well, going back to these vines and stuff for all the stuff you're trying to do, if, if the vineyard just had grass and, and the robots were just maintaining that, you have no corrosion, no issues, you can see everything on the vine, it's all there. It, it, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. But, it's, it's, but the thing is, you have to change the, the way that people think about it, right? Right. Like right now, I'm having issues with solar farms. They want me to robotically mow. And, and it's a little statue, but you're going to appreciate this. They want me to robotically mow for them. And right now, I'm telling solar farms, I can robotically mow them for a couple hundred bucks a month. And it's going to mow them every day. So you think about it, it's 50 bucks an acre. That, that's what it is. $200 a month, it's $50 an acre a week. And they're like, oh, that seems like a fair price, but we only need you to do it five times a year. And I'm like, why? Well, we just, we can't go over our, our panel. Okay, well, robotic mowers don't work that way. And then you come and find out they're paying $500 an acre to mow it 
five times a year. So I'm coming up and I tell them, I'm really not that much more expensive. Right. And now when your technicians show up to fix the panels, they don't have to deal with that tall grass. They don't have to deal with the bugs. They don't have right. to deal with the mice. Because all of these things go away when you cut grass. But it's a no-brainer for me, probably a no-brainer for you. And I still have to convince them to change the way they do it. And if solar is not yep. that long, what, five or ten years to change the way they're doing it. Anyways, sorry about that. Now I'm on a rant. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, it's one of the lessons I've learned over the years that I keep having to relearn um, with patients is um, that I, I always take it personally when if you're trying to pitch somebody on your product and they, they say no and you, you're thinking – you're hurt and you're upset and you know, oh my goodness, why, what, what's wrong with me? And, and what I've learned in the startup game is um, there are early adopters. I'm an early adopter of technology. You know, the first iPhone came out, I was the, the, st the stupid person who waited in line for five hours to pay twice as much for a phone that sort of worked. You know, that's me. That's me. I'm the early yeah. adopter. I find people like me in my, in my uh, industry in the business I'm in, and they're out there. They are not just early adopters, they're enthusiastic early adopters. So we have vineyards we work with in different countries that are like, you. they're just like a kid in a, in a I mean, it's like a toy, a kid in a, in a, a toy store. They're like, oh my God, yeah. can you do this? What about this? What about that? So they have no problem embracing it. And if you get enough of them, they can't make you rich. They can't make you build a gigantic company, but they can certainly get you started. And they will push you. They will push you and try this and that and everything else. And in the course of doing that, you then start to center on maybe the value prop that's would be acceptable to to a much larger group of people. There's a great book called, uh, written into 2000s called Crossing the Chasm. If I were to recommend a book on tech startup to any of your listeners, and if you only ever read one book, it's Crossing the Chasm written in 2000. And basically the author who's an anthropologist who studied tech companies said, look, here's a problem tech companies have. They can get the company started with the early adopters, but if they want to get broad scale acceptance, they have to cross this chasm. And this chasm is moving from the folks like me who buy the first gadget that comes out, which doesn't work, is very expensive, um, to move into the larger, much, much larger a body of people who are not willing to try new things uh, right away. And that, and that crossing that chasm is the hardest thing I think startups do. And one way to get over it is to get enough of these early adopters and to get them ha to have a consistent view of what you bring in terms of value and then share that with, with the other folks. So that's my experience. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know that you hit it on the head. I, I, in the beginning, for me, I started. I thought because I am so passionate about it. I, I tell people, people are always like, "Man, you're always smiling." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's a great day. It, you know, it's, it's a great time to be alive, in my opinion." You know, and uh, you know, so, but yeah, I decided. You know, I, I need to focus on spending my time with people like yourself. That's why I love doing this podcast because we all inspire each other to make us realize there are other like-minded people out there and we're not the outlier that everybody thinks we are, you know? Um, and, and and it just kind of realize, you know, then the people will, it, it'll come, you know, the true adoption curve will hit. Everything I'm doing right now is trying to figure out how I'm going to um, gobble that, that up when the adoption curve hits, you know? So what my yep. advice to people is, don't get discouraged. Don't think it's never going to happen. Realize it will happen. Um, and instead of, because I've, I've followed a lot of people that are early adopters and then they get skipped over, right? All of a sudden now somebody else takes it and they, and they yep. feel like it's stolen. But when I look at it, it's because 
while they were in the passion and all excited, they were figuring out how they were going to funnel it to themselves when the curve hits. So right now, that's yep. what I've been telling my team. We need to make just the most massive sales funnel to bring it when it comes, um, and, and then that's it. And, and, you know, like I said, when I talk to people like you, that all really starts to click because it becomes very circular or integrated, I should say. You know, now, now you're just not cutting grass. You're, you're cutting grass and you're figuring out if there's a plant health issue and yeah. uh, or if there's a fungus, you know, it's like, like think of turf uh, on the flip side, you know, there's so many different turf funguses that people have to come out. I could sell that data to True Green. If I worked with you taking this data and then sold that data to True Green, who's servicing all these accounts, they're just going to provide better service. Which means yep. their people will never cancel. So yeah, that's what I'm looking to do in the in the future. I hope it works out. I, or I, I shouldn't say I hope. I'm I'm sure it, that will end up happening. It it, it will. I I think too. You made the point too about so. Well, the mowers are cutting grass. You know, they're not just looking down; they're looking around. Yeah. And there there are a bunch of assets. I'm sure in that lawn, whatever it might be, on that plane of grass on and around that also need looked at by somebody. And it and often the judgment isn't necessarily some deeply detailed, it's a kind of a binary, hey, is this thing there or not? Is this green? Is it or whatever it might be? Simple kind of judgments. There's just no human available to go look at this stuff. And so yeah. and so often it it's it's actually the inspection process is quite simple. And, um, and again, sensing now has reached a point where, you know, it's, 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 it's sophisticated to, it can do amazing things. So, yeah. So, um, so, so I have one more question on how it communicates back and then, and then I want to find out about more, you know, part of the show is always finding about finding out about Mark, you know, I, yeah. I want to learn more about you. Right. But, yeah. but. So, okay, so you have all this data to communicate. Let, let's say yeah. I put them on my, on my motors, right? Yeah. How, how do you get that data to your server? Yeah, so it two ways. One is the uh, cameras themselves process some of the data. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about a contract we got. Talk about NASA in a second. Okay. You'll, you'll really like this. You're the third person i've had on the show that talks about nasa i seriously oh. every time someone brings up nasa i think i might be the luckiest guy in the world to talk about, about nasa contracts well, anyways, go ahead. well they're so. they're a customer so i'll come back to that um okay. the uh some of it's processed on the device there's a lot of image data so that gets skinny down a little bit by the processing on the device and then the rest goes up to the cloud either by wi-fi the a uh, uh, camera will search for a friendly Wi-Fi. If that's not available, we have um, what I call sneaker net, which effectively is a hard drive. You just plug into the uh, uh, side of the camera and it sucks all the data out. We use something called, um, for those people who probably never heard of this, something called snow cone. So Amazon makes a, a hard drive. It's about yay big. And it, if you've seen that printed ink, it looks like paper. It has yeah. a label that prints, so you don't have to do anything to it. You plug it in, literally, and just put it in the mail. You don't put it in an envelope or write an address, nothing. You just plug it in, it prints on a screen the label, and you just put it in the mail. And the next day, we get it. So for, for that, either if the Wi-Fi, because rural areas, for many cases, or in some cases, we're in, like I say, we're in Bordeaux, France, we're in northern Italy, we're in Peru. You know, those places don't all have 5G. So it's just an efficient way to get the data uh, uploaded. In some cases, growers have their own, uh, you can plug it in to your own uh, uh, system. Some people have, some growers are big enough where they have servers where literally you can just download it, you know, onto that. So, so there's different ways to get the data up to the cloud. That's the, it's, it, we thought it would be a big problem and challenge, but for the growers we work with, it's just not a problem. Some of the growers are, would be smaller vineyards. You're talking 200, give or take acres. Some are 
growers we work with have 18,000 acres, 20,000 acres. Um, you know, those bigger growers have a lot of assets like that yeah. uh, other folks don't have. So, well, not even that Elon Musk Starlink or whatever, you know, that, that, that should yeah. get you a Wi Fi any place. So, right? Yeah, and there's uh, there's different uh, things we're looking at. Like, uh, I can't see enough good things about Trimble. Trimble makes an RTK system that's, that's pretty pretty effective. Verizon has a system called Bullseye uh, that is a uh, uh, for those who don't want to pay for an RTK system, you can get uh, localization and uh, Wi-Fi capabilities. Uh, different parts of the country. But if I may, let me talk about my NASA thing. You'll like this. Yeah. So, the, so there's a greenhouse uh, in the International Space Station. Uh, it's about the size of a refrigerator. Um, and in that, they have been growing peppers, um, leafy greens, various sorts, uh, for quite a while. And they want to test the ability of uh, crops to grow in space, given weightlessness, radiation. Why? Because they believe, NASA believes, it's the only way that we'll be able to explore deep space, including Mars, is if we actually grow our own crops. The idea that you can pack enough food to go to Mars, yeah, so it's not going to happen. So you have to grow crops in space. And we work with a gentleman named Ralph Ritchie, who's in charge of space crops for NASA. And right now we've created in our offices a version of what's in space in our humble offices in Pittsburgh, because we're going to build a version of that camera, if all works out, that will go into the ISS within two years and monitor crops in space. Wow, good for you, man. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I told a friend, I said, we got tired of, of uh, I said, we're the, only, we're the only company in the world that can claim a, a uh, tier one sort of vineyard in Bordeaux, France, a blueberry grow in Peru, and NASA as customers. Yeah, I, I, seriously, it's, that is that's fantastic. <laughs> so, well, I'm telling you, I, I, and I'm saying it straight up like this, I, I'm going to figure out how to take our area that we have at the nursery. Like I've got a little 14 acre plot that's close enough to pick up our bike. I probably at a building. And I, I just want to put grass in there and let my robots move around and see what you can see with my robots moving around in a nursery, looking up at trees. I, I'm telling you, it's, I, I think it'd be a great kind of. Uh, I, Joe, I think trees. Together. I've always believed trees are trees are a market. I, I've always believed that. I uh, whether they be ornamental, forests, you name it. I, I think trees. Somebody has to go look. I would say somebody's got to look at the plant. Somebody. Yeah. Well, I'm like for us, I mean, we put we put the trees in. You know. We, uh, you know, they need sprayed. I mean, you know, they, they have to be A quality trees. I mean, the way it is in the nursery business, if I can sell an A quality autumn blaze maple, even at wholesale right now, it's 220 bucks. But once once you lose a leader or something gets broken, um, on, on especially evergreen trees, if a bird lands on that leader, yeah. now if you don't see it quick enough, now you don't have a leader, you're cutting that back. So yeah, there's huge value and there's huge, huge things that can get identified without somebody out looking at it every day, you know? Yeah. Um, and it can recognize too, you know, it's like, oh, you brought up uh, um, the different plants. Well, to me, I look at it, I know in the 176 acres we have, there's different soil in each one of those parcels. Some are high clay, some are loam, some have some sand. All those plants react differently. The, the ones in, in sand, if we're really wet, those right. plants grow great because it's well drained. The other than my clay side yep. of the nursery, it can be dry and those plants do great. But if it's wet, they struggle. You know, so these are all things that you can notice and then deal. With, yep. You know, so absolutely, that, awesome. absolutely. Yeah. So, so I don't want to take up the whole time on tech. I feel like. <laughs> Me and I, we might have to get our phone numbers after this. And just yeah, talk sure. About stuff. But, uh, Happy to. But tell me about you, though. Background, family, you know, uh, what, you know, even down to your first job. Okay. Cause yeah. we all got here somehow. And, and I want to yeah. know how that happened. So, first job was cutting grass. 
I kid you not. Shit. That was my first job, cutting grass. Now, uh, the lawnmowers, the lawnmowers I used probably wouldn't make it through the safety requirements of today's lawnmowers. That's all I'm going to say. Like the lawnmowers I had when I was a kid, you know, uh, not the safest, but nope, did cutting grass and painting. Those were my two first jobs. And then uh, uh, for a time worked in my uncle's, uh, my uncle had a beer distributor. He, he basically was like a drive through. So I was like a teenager and helped deliver. And I used to deliver beer. So I had to, uh, a keg is 167 and a half pounds. So I was in sports in high school and that was good training to, I was a wrestler. So that was help, helped me develop as a wrestler, being able to pick up a full keg, 167 and a half pound keg. Uh, problem was after I lifted enough kegs, I'd want to drink that beer, but I wasn't old enough to drink it, but that's a whole nother story. Um, what class did you wrestle in by the way in high school? In high school, uh, 121 and, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you were a small guy in high school. Yeah, I was a little guy. You were lifting, you were lifting 165 pounds. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That I was. That. I was in better shape when I was younger, but uh, but I I uh, so did that and uh, went off to college in Ohio at the University of Dayton, and then uh, ended up uh, uh, you know getting a couple degrees there. Went to uh, went to Washington D.C actually is my career first career move kind of strange background that i have here joe since you asked um about 14 years in washington um in all kinds of capacities in government so i worked on capitol hill for a couple congressmen um one guy named tom ridge who ended up becoming governor of pennsylvania and became homeland security secretary eventually and then another guy named Mike DeWine, who, if anybody's listening in Ohio, would know that Mike's now governor of Ohio. Um, and I went there back when they were congressmen. And then um, worked for a senator, uh, John Hines uh, from Pennsylvania. Worked for Booz Allen, a consulting firm for a while. Um, I worked for a senator up until he passed away in 91. He sadly passed away to a plane crash. No, know that your listeners would have any memory of that. But... Um, and then ended up working for the first president Bush in the white house. Uh, I worked for the science advisor to the president and, uh, I didn't see any of this in my research. I, I, yeah. I, I need to get better at research. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's, I don't include that in my LinkedIn. Uh, people know how old I am, but, um, and then, uh, and then lastly finished up my time in Washington, DC as a lobbyist for Texas instruments. So uh, back from Texas Instruments used to be a much bigger company. I had a joke for all those listening. They have an opinion of what a corporate lobbyist is and for what it's worth. When I left, I was 35 when I left Washington to start a new life here in Pittsburgh as an entrepreneur. When I left, all my uh, high-tech lobbyist friends had a party for me at my favorite restaurant. And they gave me a bumper sticker and it said, please don't tell my mother I'm a corporate lobbyist. She thinks I'm a piano player in a brothel in New Orleans. So that's for anybody listening, <laughs> uh, you know, that's what corporate lobby is the respect you get. But anyway, so I did that up to the age of 35 and then decided I uh, wanted to change my life and do something else. And I moved to Pittsburgh where I grew up. And so you're talking 2000 or so. And right in the middle of the dot com storm. Um, and uh, hooked up with a company that it ended up becoming a Reba um, online auctions and the company went public and I was a consultant and I had my first exposure to startups. I said, Hey, this is easy and fun. And then I said, I'm going to start my own company. And that actually didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> and so which, which company was that, that their first startup then? Well, my first one was a company called mobile fusion and it was, sort of spun out of Carnegie Mellon and we made, and this may sound like some kind of James Bond thing, but it made a ball, uh, uh, looked like a pineapple actually. And it was packed with sensors and then a soldier or Marine would throw it into a, what they military called a denied area. So, a, a building. And before you go charging through the door, you'd throw this in the window 
and then it would sweep the room using sensors to tell you somebody or somebody's are in that room and where they are and all that. And so we ended up uh, getting a lot of money from the Marine Corps and the Navy and even an Intel agency. We built an upright version of it to look at distances and objects and stuff. Um, so that's my first exposure to artificial intelligence. So this is, you know, mid, you know, 2004, 2005, six. Um, it's when it was just sort of working. And I remember one day my co-founder and I, um, we got a, met, him, met with a colonel. And they did a lot of testing. We got a lot of money from the Pentagon to, you know, develop it and develop it. But, you know, we're a business. Eventually, we have to sell these things. And we can't just keep developing and so yeah. this, this Marine Corps colonel, like right out of central casting, you know, like Jack Nicholson and, you know, you know, yeah. right, right. And you want he's the like, truth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want the truth. He goes, you know, got, you know, boys, I really like what you're doing. You know, someday we might put these in the field, you know, a few more years of testing. And I didn't hear a single thing he said after that. <laughs> I, did, I didn't hear a single word he said. After. A few more years of testing was all I needed to hear. And my you know, co-founder and I looked at each other and said, wow, we don't have the money. We don't have the capacity. We're not lucky Martin here. You know, we got to, yeah. we got to figure out another path forward. So we took the technology, repointed it um, into the power space. Now I won't bore you with the details why we chose that market, but in summary, uh, we are in, in the United States, seven markets where power Wholesale power is bought and sold every day. The famous one recently was the ERCOT. That's, that's where Texans buy and sell wholesale power every day to move power around so nobody's without power at the lowest price possible. Well, that's done in many markets across the United States, and it is a commodity market, largest commodity market in the world. Now, no one knows it exists because it's a what, a, what, what you would call a virtual market where people are moving power around um, in a, in a sort of a virtual sense. So what we did, very simply, um, is we've used artificial intelligence to predict what the price of power would be in, say, Cleveland at noon uh, tomorrow, or what the price of power would be in Minneapolis or Birmingham, Alabama. And by being, being able to use a lot of data and a lot of fancy AI, we were able to come up with pretty decent enough predictions to the point where General Electric actually ended up being um, uh, one of our investors. They ultimately invested many millions when they had a venture fund who ended up, re I didn't realize this, but General Electric uh, generates one quarter of all the power that's generated in the world every day. Somewhere in the world is being generated by a GE generator that tells you anything about GE. And they were great. GE was wonderful. They were a partner. They were a customer and an investor. And we were able to develop the technology to get big users of power like steel mills and aluminum factories. Safeway was a customer back in the day. Um, advanced that company. We spun out a, a hedge fund out of that. Uh, where you help people buy and sell wholesale power, you can trade, uh, you can go on and on. Um, and then, oh, please do. And this, this yeah. stuff is interesting. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll have to have a second one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that that may led that led me to robotics, which is I met a guy who was a professor at CMU, and he said, "Hey, I've got this AI. You know, we can." I was saying earlier in the show. We use cell phones to look at asphalt and concrete and look for features on the road and then tell the city, you know, the condition of their roads. And that's what we did. We developed that and sold that to over 160, 170 cities and six countries. So if you're in London, uh, that company which still exists doing well, um, that company is assessing the streets of Westminster uh, in London using AI and cell phones and cars and vehicles for driving around London. So um, that, at that point, uh, got that company started. We raised 12 million, got it to 200 
cities ultimately and decided to say, hey, maybe I want to kick back. I'm a um, shareholder. Um, you know, it's fun, but, you know, I'm going to hand the keys to my co-founder and they'll take it further. And I was ready to kind of, I wouldn't say retirement, but, you know, I was going to kick back as I teach. And uh, so I'm at it. Uh, you'll appreciate this. And this, you may, I'm sure you're going to suffer. If you don't already suffer from this affliction, Joe, you, you will. I was like, oh, I'm going to kick back for take six months, maybe a year. And I was three weeks into it. I met the founders of this company. He said, could you be an advisor to us? You know, we, what do you do? We take pictures of plants and then we use the, I think I was like two minutes into the, I, like, I got to be a part of this. I, I just, I, I, suffer from this. I was like, I actually, yeah, go ahead. no, I was like, I, this is crazy here. I, here I was like ready to, you know, like, Oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm good for a while. Nope. So I, I just, no, it's, I can't it's help almost, myself. I almost sometimes wonder if it's like, you could almost classify it as a, as a mental illness because I, <laughs> I, I because, because I find myself like people are always like, dude, you got to, you got to calm down. You got to relax. You know, you're going to be done by the time you're 50. And what, what's weird what is the days that I don't have anything to do, A, all I do is sit and like imagine doing something else. And B, I find myself like, like I, I become so bored. It almost is depressing. Oh, I, I we know, this you, and, you, know? you and I know a dirty little secret. The dirty little secret is if we're really honest with ourselves, what we do every day isn't really work. It's our passion. Right. It's not. It's, it's our passion. You're right. It's and and that's where we're fortunate. People say, "Why would you endure the stress of you know you're going to run out of money or or uh, who name whatever horror may befall you as an entrepreneur?" And it you know usually does at some point or another, and you survive. Is why would you endure that? And I always remember the quote by Nietzsche, and he says. Um, um, once you know the why, you can endure anyhow. Well, once you know the why, you can endure anyhow. When it's when it's your passion, it's not suffering. It's just what you got to do to realize your dream, to yeah. your passion, to to do what you love. So, yeah, it's stressful. Yeah, it's hard. But you know what? Hard to me, work is standing in the line and in Pennsylvania at the Department of Motor Vehicles waiting to get my license renewed. That's work. <laughs> That's true. I just had to do that in Illinois. It was crazy. <laughs> and I had a CEL, so I had to retake a test. And, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I, you could not put it any better. I, I, and I tell people all the time, and, and, and the whole point of the show is to inspire people to yeah. follow your heart follow your passion um, and to not allow any like, like to not allow the people that do show up in a job to stifle the passion, you know? Right. Because they just don't understand it. Like they, they don't understand what makes you tick because they're not fortunate enough to have. One. Right. Yeah. Right. It is. Uh, I have a friend who uh, uh, is a retired Navy SEAL officer and he is also an entrepreneur and he's about my age. And he said, you know, entrepreneurship's like being a Navy SEAL. You just have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And at some level, you know, it's that, it's that challenge. Probably Joe, you're like me. That's that challenge that drives you forward. You, you don't have to have anybody explain to you why people climb Mount Everest, Right. It, yeah. it, it takes no explanation to you yeah. Yeah. to say, well, here, let me tell you why I climb it. I already know because I do it every day. I get it. it, it well, and, and so, and so my own brother, you know, um, you know, we, we live a, a content, I mean, you know, a good life right now, you know, so my brother's always like, like, Joe, why, why do you need more? Why, 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 you know, why do you need to go national? What if we just stay regional with these robots? And, and and I say, John National, I I'll go international if I can. You know? Right, like, right, like, right. Yeah. And, 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 and he's like, why? I'm like, to say I could do it. You know, that's the Mount Everest thing. You know, why would you climb Mount Everest to say that you did it? You know. So so exactly. I tell people all the time, I'm like, 
like because I, you, you know, you interested me, and I want to almost circle back on in a second about you know the, the that startup that went public, and you were a part of that. You know, I I tell people like when I start talking about robot, robotic lawnmowers, I have more people that want to invest in my company than I have people wanting to buy robotic lawnmowers. It's actually the craziest thing, and I I have that happen. And I'm like, this should be a public company. Like I need to actually try to figure out what I need to do to scale this up to go public. And when I tell people that, they're like, do you really want to have a public company? I'm like, I want to say, I, I, I want to say, I've had an LLC, I've had an S Corp, um, and I want to say that I've had an enterprise value business, and I want to say that I've had a public business, which I, I'm looking at your resume, it's kind of like the way that it is, because it's part of, part of the success is also the education. So I'm like a self-educated person. So Everything that I do, every different type of business that I open, right. the fuck is the education doing? Right. right, right. It's the learning. It's the challenge of it's the, it's the, it's that sense that there's another world that you're going to enter. And uh, you know, I've been in defense. I've been in power. I've been in education. I've been in uh, road maintenance. I've been in now ag, and you know. And in every instance, uh, I remember when I first started with this ag thing, I thought, ag, I, I mean, who, you know, I, not, I'm the furthest thing you could be from a farmer. And yeah, but now that I'm into it, I get, I'm, I'm hooked. I never yeah. imagined I would feel this way, but agriculture is one of the most fascinating industries in the world. And, yeah. and to me, it's a, I get the fruits of being an entrepreneur and, you know, the, all the challenges of that and the fruits, like you say, Joe, of learning, of learning about an industry and, and, and how people solve a very important fundamental challenge, which is how do we feed the world? Yeah. You know, how do we feed the world? No, for sure. Uh, so, by the way, I, I usually ask before the show, but I didn't ask, do you have any hard stop time? Because we, we have had some great content i can i can keep going i don't sometimes i probably i do have a uh i do have a call that starts now but that's okay i can do i could have a hard stop at 310 okay uh are 10 you minutes so yeah 10 yeah minutes? Okay. yeah yeah so uh yeah so i yeah, one of the things I tell people too as an entrepreneur, and I think you'll get it too, you start to notice people's body language. And I noticed he kept like looking over to the sides. So I was like, oh, I think there's something <laughs> Like, we're running late. He, he's got to do something. So I don't know if you were looking at the clock, but I can tell you were looking at something. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, so, uh, you know, one of the, one of the questions that I usually ask is, uh, you know, if you went back 20 years, you know, back to 20 years ago, would yeah. you have done anything different, tell yourself anything different, or is it all, and I think I already know the answer, yeah. but is it all the way you would want it to be? I don't know what I would change. Um, I guess I probably would have said, I probably would have said, go easy on yourself. You know, be be good to yourself. Be give yourself a break. You know, when you're doing a hard thing, and believe me, you know, starting and building business is really hard. Um, really, really hard. And you beat yourself up. You're like, oh, I didn't know that. I wish I'd known that. Or should I? I had no idea. Why did I sign that? Why did I agree to that? Why did I hire that person? You know, why did I take money? You know, you're constantly, it's just one mistake after another. It's like trying to figure out a, a clear path through a minefield by stepping on every mine. You know, you'll eventually find a way through it, but believe me, it's there's got to be a better way. <laughs> Less painful, but it's, there isn't. It's, it's a game. And so if I could say this to myself, I'd say, as you prepare for this journey, just be more forgiving of yourself, that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, you know, a friend of mine says, it's okay to have 
in your business. It's okay to have problems. It's normal. It's not okay to keep having the same problem. <laughs> that's when it, that's when a problem is a problem when it keeps coming back. But I think if I were to say that, that would be the big thing is just the, be more patient with my own learning. Um, be more forgiving. Um, in this game, the other thing is you, you always think, and I'm sure the listeners out there who are doing entrepreneurs, some of them may be listening and thinking, okay, yeah, that's easy to say, but I'm on my last, you know, I don't have any more cards right now. I'm against the wall. This is it. I'm finished. I've tried every trick I'd book. I've, I've knocked on every door. I've turned every lever. I've had every conversation and there's no path forward. I'm done. I'm finished. If I had a nickel for every time I said that, and it turned out not to be true. That's the point, yeah. And it turned out not to be true. There's always a way forward. There's, it's never fatal. You just figure it out. I agree. The best pivots I've ever had in any of my businesses, the pivot happened because the profitability was slipping. We were, you know, you, you looked at it and you were like, oh my gosh, like, I'm getting high up on my credit line here. How many? Yeah. Do? And and then you just you say, okay, you make some tough decisions, and then boom, it's all working. And then you say, okay, just don't make that, don't let that happen again. And I'll yeah. never be in the situation. I mean, it, it, it is owning businesses are just like anything else you do in life. It's about it's even when you think back to being a kid, if you burn yourself on the stove, you 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 realize you, you don't you don't grab another pot holder again. It's like, don't yep, and they and you move on, and it, before you know, it's in the rearview mirror. And yeah. and and by the way, the good news is you're now that much smarter. Um, I mean, there are things that I you know bad judgments, mistakes I made, um, and almost always. <clears throat> that has helped me in the next thing I did. It protected me. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's the thing about being a serial entrepreneur is, you know, I always tell myself like, you know, so if I make a bad decision in this business with the robotic lawnmowers, like let's say I take money from the wrong person and get diluted out too fast or something, then, it, and I'm not even at that point yet, but I know I'm gonna have to get to that point. At the end of the day, I'll still know I catapulted it and I'll just start another one. You know, that that's kind You'll of get right going. back at it again. And that's yeah, you know, so. and that's it. And and for those who are listening, you may think, oh yeah, it's fine for them to say it, but it's it's true of everybody. And we all have it in us. I, you know, the famous quote, everybody has at least one good book in them. Right. And that's the same for starters. I want to write a book. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> what you say, huh? I, and actually, I'm going to tell you what I've been thinking about it being called, and it's actually kind of almost sounds like a depressing book, but it's it's actually meant for inspiration. Is it, you know, I, it's like it's going to be something like you know, you know, the rise can feel lonely, or it's going to be something like that. Because one of the biggest things that I struggle with is as I continue to move up professionally and elevate myself, I make the mistake. I expect everyone in my life to want to want to come up with me. So I'm always trying yeah. to like pull them up. But yeah. a lot of them are like, hey, dude, I don't want anything to do with that shit. I'm staying where I'm at. Yeah. And it, right. it, it makes you feel kind of lonely because it feels yeah. like you're always like, it's like you want everybody to climb the ladder with you. And then, and then I find myself feeling like I'm leading that. And I'm never really leaving that, but it is it is an emotion that I feel. And it's like, I almost like feel like I need to put pen to paper and write it because I cannot be the only person that feels this way. You're not. And that's the other thing about this is when you go on these journeys, particularly when you succeed, um, is it, it, it again, may seem counterintuitive, but it can be anticlimactic because here you are and the success you've dreamed about happens and you're, you're, you're standing there alone. And, but the good news is, is you never achieve that alone. I mean, people say, uh, people, you know, I, they, they talk about entrepreneurship and an individual struggle, he, he or she, 
you know, it's that individual plus a team, it's family, it's yeah. your parents, the way you were brought up, your friends, investors along the way, key employees along the way. It's a team effort. It doesn't mean that everybody's at the championship game that helped you when you win the championship, but you were helped along by a lot of people and you yeah. are, uh, they are enjoying the benefits of your success because they know what they did for you. And um, so it's, it's a team sport in the end, but it is, it can be, it can be lonely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just have to be mentally ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. So you said in two, uh, 210 or yeah. one, uh, three times. So we're also kind of over it. I'm going to I'm gonna end it with this because I ask every guest. Uh, so at the end of the day, I always ask what you want your legacy to be. What do you want to be remembered as? I know you're teaching people. Yeah. You, you know, so, so end it with that. It's, you know, I help, yeah, I would say I helped people. I helped people, you know, grow. I, that's it. I mean, I, if my, what I try to do in, in this company and anything I've done is to give people the opportunity for personal growth. And that's, that's my mission is to try to give people a chance for personal growth. Well, I can tell you, to, you've, you, you've helped me personally grow just in this uh, hour and 10 minutes we spent together. Oh, uh, you're, so, you're kind. So, so, so you're doing good. And you're helping plants grow. So, so everything is <laughs> kind of you know? So, <laughs> that's great so, uh, that's great yeah yeah so anyways it's been it's been a blast mark i'm telling you i hope we talk more i actually i'm Me too. upset if we don't talk more uh um, too joe i'll let you get onto your call i'm gonna talk all to right. you for another hour and 10 minutes if we can <laughs> so have all right sir you uh, too buddy see you Bye.